Okay, good evening. Welcome to the first headache and facial pain case discussion from the ASRA Headache Special Interest Group. My name is Nat Schuster. I'm a headache and pain neurologist at the UC San Diego Center for Pain Medicine, and I will be moderating tonight. And we are joined tonight by an amazing group of panelists from across the U.S. We have first, going to alphabetical order, Dr. Charles Argoff, who's professor of neurology at Albany Medical College, director of the Comprehensive Pain Center at Albany Medical Center, and director of the Pain Management Fellowship in Albany, New York. And he is the vice president of scientific affairs for the American Academy of Pain Medicine, and one of the editors of Raj's uh, Practical Management of Pain 6th Edition. Dr. G Jahan Grant is director of the Headache and Facial Pain Center at Mount Sinai Hospital in New York, and she is triple boarded in neurology, headache medicine, and interventional pain medicine. Dr. Narayan Kassoon is a assistant professor in neurology and anesthesia at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota, and he too is board certified in neurology, pain medicine, and headache medicine. Dr. Sean Chen is a pain management physician and clinical associate professor of anesthesiology, uh, perioperative and pain medicine at Stanford University in Palo Alto, California. And his special interests include treatment of acute and chronic pain with special interest in migraine, headache, trigeminal neuralgia, glossopharyngeal neuralgia, hemifacial spasm, and atypical facial pain. And Dr. Nicole Spare is a clinical assistant professor of Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation in Neurology at the Jefferson Headache Center at uh, Thomas Jefferson University in Philadelphia. And she is one of the few PMNR uh, headache specialists at, in, a, um, in a neurology based uh, headache center. So, welcome to all of our panelists. So, how to ask questions. So you can click on the chat button at the bottom of your screen and to send a question to the panelists or to connect with your peers, you can type your message in the chat box and click enter and your questions will be responded to during the session as time permits. So thank you to the ASRA members who have submitted cases that we'll be discussing tonight. So our first case is a patient with a 30 year history of unilateral right-sided headache who was referred by a neurosurgeon who was thinking about doing a vertebral occipital fusion. So this patient was 65 years at the time that this doctor met uh, her, a woman, BMI 28, years since headache, onset 30 years. And so her headaches occur with varying periods of remission in between, longest period was two months. The vib and she reported that vibrations caused attacks or sudden neck movements such as when her husband suddenly steps on the car brake, emotional tension or light touch of her facial skin, hair or neck muscles, and interestingly, the contralateral and ipsilateral carotid areas, superior cervical ganglion areas, um, I guess if uh, pressed upon, um, would trigger these attacks. And she also cannot tolerate high frequency alarms or noises, pressure, or even lightly touching the skin, where the stabbing pain typically begins in her occipital region, immediately initiates an attack, and the area remains tender in between. The attacks always start at the same occipital area. She typically describes these attacks as a stabbing pain and sometimes an electrical shock that feels like a thick, sharp needle inserted into the back of her head, always on the same spot. The pain is not very severe, four to five out of 10, is a very short duration, five to 10 seconds, and then spreads linearly to her ipsilateral maxillary or nares area. It has extended to her mandibular once or twice into her tongue, but only once or twice. After such pain, her head feels thick as if she has a high blood pressure in her head. The pain and symptoms are only present on the right side of her head, never on the left side. So the doctor who uh, suggested this case, who um, submitted this case, made a diagnosis of epicrania fugax. And uh, because, as he said, there was no treatment suggestions in the literature. Um, and because uh, he had previously used this uh, for patients with tax, he performed bilateral uh, suprazygomatic pterygopalatine ganglion blocks, um, after which these symptoms immediately 
uh, resolved. And he did show, um, he did submit some pictures to us, uh, one beforehand where the patient did appear to have uh, conjunctival injection and ptosis, uh, and then after the block where this had resolved, um, and then placed her on a, um, a transcutaneous auricular vagus nerve stimulator as well, and the patient reportedly now totally symptom-free for the past five months. The longest asymptomatic time over the past 30 years was two months before being on this um, transcutaneous auricular vagus nerve stimulator. Interestingly, he reported lastly, she feels very agitated and in her words, fed up during an attack and um, said that these attacks come more than 15 times per month. So these attacks are followed by ptosis, swelling of the right upper eyelid and absence of frontal muscle action on the right side that remains for weeks to months. She also has other autonomic symptoms on the right side, such as lacrimation, conjunctival injection, rhinorrhea, and ipsilateral nasal congestion. So pertinent uh, patient history, multiple cervical spine surgeries, multiple occipital nerve blocks with only minimal relief for a day or two, no prior family headache history, no allergies reported. And so the treatments that had been provided um, he says nothing about before these pterygopalatine ganglion blocks and transcutaneous auricular vagus nerve stimulation was only using over-the-counter sparingly without positive res results. And um, exam um, says non-contributory except for the right lower eyelid started twitching immediately after light palpation of the left contralateral parotid artery. And um, as I mentioned from the pictures, you can see uh, the ptosis and um, contratival injunction. And then labs, none except elevated IL-6 blood value. So um, Gaurav Chauhan is going to uh, speak to us a little bit about the diagnosis that people who are here might not be familiar with that was um, suggested by the doctor who submitted this case. I don't know that he has made it in yet. He has not made it in yet. Okay. So then um, I will present it then. So um, it's a primary headache disorder. Uh, rule out all other causes uh, of headache first described in 2008. So this is at this point in the appendix of the ICHD3. And so the pain pattern, the description generally, focal area in posterior scalp with forward radiation in a linear or a zigzag line, um, and um, then reaches the ipsilateral eye, forehead, nose in one to 10 seconds, or there's a backward variant where it goes the opposite from front to occiput. And so this doesn't respect the trigeminal or occipital nerve distributions. Um, and so that makes it, differentiates it from a supraorbital or a occipital neuralgia. Uh, static components, throbbing pain can have, have over the originating spot and uh, can have a dynamic component, this radiating pain in linear or zigzag lines. And so has a female predominance, 2.1 to 1. Uh, site of origin could be occipital, temporal, parietal. Uh, duration generally one to 15 seconds. And interestingly, 42% of the time was reported with autonomic symptoms, uh, typical triggers, touch, neck movements, uh, stress, um, the clinical course and treatment. So the frequency can really, what little literature is out there, it can be many times a day to being infrequent. Um, so really a broad um, frequency, unlike what we know about the trigeminal autonomic cephalalgias, where there's really much more of a stereotyped frequency, but they give the episodic frequency of less than 15 episodes per month, chronic more than 15 episodes per month. Um, and so suggested treatments uh, include the antipoleptics, gabapentin, Lyrica, lamotrigine, carbamazepine, uh, second line, tricyclic antidepressants, NSAIDs, and injections that can be considered supraorbital, supratrochlear, greater occipital nerve blocks. And so this is really, you know, you think about the common headaches, you think about the zebras, this is rarer than zebras and really, um, you know, not the only diagnosis that when I heard about this case that I was thinking about. So 
the um, let's talk about the differential here. So I'd like to open things up to our pa panel, and I know Dr. Spare is excited to uh, discuss her thoughts about this case. Thank you for having me. So. When refer, especially when you have trainees, referring to the International Classification of Headache Diagnosis in the third edition is an excellent resource as a common language to be able to, to speak amongst each other. However, the anatomy and pathophysiology never follow these exact rules. And like you said, with the, the timing of some of these attack durations to differentiate the various trigeminal anomics of phalanges is where that's, that's in the minutia. So, when you think about this spectrum of, of headaches, we've got to come back to our clinical history taking and the art of doing so. And, you know, in a patient like this, if this has been going on for greater than 30 years, especially after having disturbance of her, tri her trigeminal system with the cervical spine surgery, you think about the central versus peripheral etiologies of what may be activating her 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 trigeminal system, you know, could this be, this could be a, a variety of things. So what came to mind when I read through this case for the first time was, well, this is a classic case of sumped, um, where this is a, a, a unilateral neuralgia form headache with um, conjunctival uh, injection and tearing. And, you know, as a headache specialist, I think about these common headache diagnoses and maybe not the full, this was a, this was not the first diagnosis on, on my differential either, but uh, having at least 20 attacks, which she clearly has had of moderate to severe intensity, unilateral head pain in the orbital, superorbital, temporal region, or it could be in the trigeminal distribution. So that I think when it wasn't following the exact anatomy, that's where, where I think that comes into play. And these attacks last anywhere between one to 600 seconds versus if you think about the paroxysmal hemicrania continuas, pH, um, which is a shorter headache uh, than what we commonly understand as cluster headache, which is anywhere between 15 minutes to three hours. Paroxysmal hemicrania is usually um, 15 minutes, two, minute, two to 15 minutes. Um, but going back to the sunk type headache, when we think about, you know, this is at least one attack ipsilateral to the area of pain that's being described, conjunctival injection and or lacrimation, uh, running of the nose, congestion, eyelid edema, which she um, endorsed, forehead and facial sweating, uh, the sensation of fullness in the ear, meiosis and or uh, ptosis. I've had patients that have described this type of headache as an arrow going through the head has been the most common um, common denominator or just story when I've had when somebody has presented with this type of headache. Now, when you think about this spectrum of tack-like headaches, we think of those that are endomethacin responsive and those that are not. And of the four, sunct or suna, so suna being without the conjunctival injection or tearing, cluster headache, and then you have your hemicrania continua and paroxysmal he hemicranias, those two respond to endomethacin. So I'm not sure if I'm looking at uh, the clinical course here, I'm not sure, it says NSAIDs, but I'm not sure if end endomethacin was tried. And oftentimes when somebody does use endomethacin, the dose, the common therapeutic dose is up to 150 milligrams. I apologize. I'm sorry for the interruption. I'm on a family vacation in a different state with very limited where I can sit. Um, and we're way past bedtime. 
Anyways, within domethacin, the typical dosing pattern is up to 150 milligrams a day. And sometimes in my practice, we've used up to 225 milligrams. So oftentimes these patients don't have a full, they may have tried a medication, but may not have gotten up to that therapeutic dose. The last thing I might want to turn over to somebody else just because of the noise in the background, but also in the same patient, you can have multiple headache types. You know, this is a primary headache diagnosis. But even, you know, she has features of migraine and migraine is more than just a headache. Some of these autonomic features, the, the prolonged pro and post-strome uh, do fit that diagnosis. And then also taking in with that history, thinking about the psychological and really addressing both the pharmacologic and non-pharmacologic treatment strategies in somebody that has had this pain, this chronic pain for so long. Excellent. Yeah, thank you so much, Dr. Spear. And I, I agree. I was thinking about these whenever you hear side locked headache uh, with um, the autonomic features described that we need to be thinking about these uh, trigeminal autonomic cephalalgias. And what I always tell my trainees is you don't need to memorize the details. Just go to Google images, type in trigeminal autonomic cephalalgias. There's a whole lot of really nice tables that will then remind them about what the frequency duration of the different trigeminal autonomic cephalalgias are, as well as the treatments. Um, when talking about uh, maybe, you know, thinking about the possibility of epicrania fugax or other um, possible diagnoses uh, for, the, for our other uh, panelists, anything that you were thinking about? May I add one quick thing? Yes, please. With the, with the parasocial hemicrania, there's a, a series of various case reports that also have spoken about a C7 radiculopathy. So that, that was the one thing I just thought of when you were, when I missed that in the original case that she's had multiple spine surgeries. So some of, I have one patient very clearly, uh, she was in her forties. Now she did have a prolactinoma, but with head rotation, she could bring on some of these radicular symptoms and a, a paroxysmal attack. I wanted to jump in there too, because I was actually going to say something quite similar to Dr. Spear, that not only do we see many different types of headache types within one patient, but many times certain things can be triggers, as she mentioned, and we notice that there may be cervicogenic triggers, not only in, in, in migraine, but many different types. So one thing is just kind of activating another process in many cases. Um, so that's something I thought about with this case, given the, the history, given the the exacerbation going over um, bumps, et cetera, and turning the head. So I just want to add and just bring up for us to discuss if this is a diagnosis of exclusion, what have we excluded? Um, she hasn't been treated from what but I can see with any cervical spine. I mean, we understand the complexity of her history, but how have we not, to your point, to your, you know, um, how have we not evaluated her for a cervicogenic component? How have we uh, are, we gonna, are we going to say, and what does her treatment and response mean? Can we infer that we've made this, that this diagnosis has been confirmed by that diagnosis? I'm, just a little, I'm personally a little bit per, 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 perplexed in how the person who submitted the case came, excluded other possibilities. And um, I'm glad that she's feeling better, but I'm not sure it confirms the diagnosis. I wonder what others think. I, I agree 100% that, uh, that the, the looking into alternative causes is very important, and uh, hopefully, in the history that maybe wasn't uh, included, is if you know if this patient was seen within a year or two of onset of the symptoms, I'd very much hope that they were evaluated for something like a carotid artery dissection or some sort of you know vertebral artery dissection. Uh, given that these sympathetic fibers kind of ride up on those uh, large vessels. Uh, and, and that is definitely one of the big diagnoses of exclusion that need to be done. Now, time, it sounds like, kind of established the benign nature of her headaches. So I think that is uh, something that is good about the story is that it kind of declared itself as uh, not a worrisome secondary disorder. But um, yeah, the idea of a uh, cervicogenic cause, um, there are a lot of case reports uh, and descriptions of cervicogenic headache or C2 neuralgia, some it's been described as, or even, uh, you know, uh, 
C23 facet arthropathies that respond to third occipital radiofrequency ablations that uh, uh, can present with this trigeminal autonomic cephalalgia. So I think looking for those secondary causes are a very important part of the story. When you speak of even just the ruling out the, the scary secondary headaches, like a dissection, a lot of these patients too, if you don't ask them, you know, they're going to nothing against seeing the chiropractor or these complementary alternative treatments, but some of these higher velocity treatments, even as an osteopathic physician myself, you know, I caution given her age, and I don't know if there were any other rheumatologic issues in her history, but making sure that there's no other forceful manipulations that are happening during these patients will do anything to get out of pain. Sometimes without taking medication. I was also curious as to whether any dynamic imaging was done, you know, as part of the workup to see whether there was any um, instability between the, you know, within the neck or anything like that that could also be triggering this. I was also curious as to whether, you know, how much brain imaging was done with, with cuts near the trigeminal nerve to make sure that we didn't have other causes as was mentioned earlier. And also dissections, just to go back to that point, they, yeah. they commonly result in nothing. I mean, they probably have transient neurological symptoms and who knows what had really happened at the onset. I think everyone really, uh, I learned tremendously from everyone's uh, unique point. Uh, I'm just impressed that the authors, uh, you know, offered the SPG block in the end uh, and the patient got great uh, results. I do have a few questions though. Uh, you know, first of all, they did a bilateral uh, SPG block. Uh, the symptoms is only on the right side. And then um, they maintained uh, the treatment and efficacies by, you know, doing this transcutaneous, uh, you know, auricular vagus nerve stimulation. Uh, just kind of wondering what is their, their rationale you know, for doing this. Um, we all know that one time a block, uh, it's amazing that you can get five months of the relief. Uh, it just kind of makes you wonder, uh, you know, what's going on? Is this, this is the, uh, you know, uh, this is truly, uh, you know, the SPG mediated, uh, you know, uh, issues or other nerves, like you guys commented, you know, cervicogenic, uh, carotidinia, others, or this is a TSA, or this is all mixed picture. Uh, I'm always fascinated by the SPG because, you know, this is, has so many multiple autonomic sensory motor neuronal connections, uh, and it could be very well many causes that kind of converged on the S, uh, SPGs, uh, and then you you hit it one time, you uh, you know downgraded the activity, it's kind of reset it. Now it's three months. It's three months more than uh, the, uh, the uh, spontaneous remission, right? The patient had like two months of longest remissions. Now it's five months. I, I don't know how, when did the author submit this case? Uh, it, maybe it's more than five months now. It's just curious to hear what is the follow-up story is about that. Yeah, so, right. There's so many questions that we have that you know, we don't necessarily know what workup has been done. We only know what was submitted. Uh, the case was submitted a few weeks ago. Um, so that's probably pretty, you know, pretty much where the patient is at, it seems, presumably. But we need to, uh, you know, sort of just work with what we're given. And so, um, right, you know, when it comes to the initial workup, especially, you know, for something that's not 30 years old, um, need to exclude um, any time that there is a trigeminal autonomic cephalalgia in the picture um, that their um, posterior fossa um, uh, pathology. And so don't want to get just a CT head where you're going to get bone artifact that's going to limit your ability, your, ab uh, uh, your ability to assess the posterior fossa, but really need to get an MRI. And the case has been made for why to get vessel imaging as well. Um, and and I, and I think Nicole brought up as well, me, well, I, I, I heard her say, uh, I think in this kind of situation where there's um, so much, I'm going to use a term, nobody criticize me, please, but enhancement and crosstalk and sensitization demonstrated by the bilaterality of, of some of her complaints and the triggering, um, does she have an underlying um, rheumatologic disorder? Did anyone even do a baseline CBC, uh, SED rate, uh, you know, just, just to have the whole picture um, and kind of get to know who she is. 
right? And and yeah, we are not given any of that. So those are all great things to think about, you know, when we do meet a patient like this. Um, what do people think about the diagnosis of epicrania fugax? I think it's a rare, I mean, for her <laughs> or yeah, in general? Yeah. <laughs> uh, both, both for her <laughs> and, and uh, in general. I'm not convinced that this is her diagnosis based upon the information that I have. Yeah, me neither. I, I, I'm not sure, you know, what is a row of SPG's involvement in, in, in this type of diagnosis. It was not mentioned, uh, you know, uh, in, in this definition. I'm not sure I'm aware of the literature to support that targeting SPG is the, you know, kind of the treatment, one of the treatments for uh, epicranial or for guys. So. Yeah, I think, uh, I think, um, I guess in this case, it kind of doesn't necessarily matter in some sense what you call it, um, but generally where it, uh, what kind of disorder. And I think the family of trigeminal autonomic cephalalgias is something that we as a group sound like we're on board with as a uh, syndrome. Um, now, is epicranial fugax going to be something that may be included in future diagnostic criteria and fit somewhere in between sunct and paroxysmal hemicrania? Maybe. Uh, who, that, that's something that I'll, that time will tell. Um, but I think the, the strategy that was used was appropriate. And I guess one question I have for the rest of the group too is, and, and I always get excited when I see patients with uh, trigeminal autonomic cephalalgias. What do you do? Uh, let's. What happens when this patient comes back with a recurring headache? Uh, what would you do? Uh, within what frequency? With within what duration of time? After five months, or because, or every week, or let's say same frequency she was at uh, before the block that she had in the vagal nerve stimulator back to the 15 times a month. I would ask her if how much impairment in terms of activities of daily living with function, personal and professional. And our program does IV lidocaine as well as IV ketamine treatments. And sometimes that's another way to to reboot and reset with this uh, process of central sensitization that has set up. But, 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 but along those same lines, if she had a five month response and we're still, you know, talking about whether or not how this could have happened and what the exact definition is, but your practical question is, what would you do when she comes back? Why wouldn't you repeat the same treatment that helped her? I, I would vote yes. Uh, and, and, you know, obviously you want to know what, what exactly did they inject? Uh, and I assume it's some sort of local anesthetics mixture was, uh, some sort of steroids, uh, and, and you know, I, I would recommend just repeating because this is a, a life changing for her uh, five months, uh, and uh, you know, she has never experienced that before. So, uh, and it's a relative speaking, a pretty safe procedure to do. So, so let's say that. So let's say I, I'm not, if I if, if it's okay uh, to our moderator, if I could throw out a question to the panel, um, do, do is this somebody who you would teach how to do SPGs? at home with viscous lidocaine and, and, and is this something you ever do? Um, and is this somebody who might be able to, um, with guidance and ongoing care, um, um, be more comfortable in general at home doing something like this? Do you ever do that? Yeah, I certainly, you know, I, I refer people to, um, Charles probably knows the same, uh, video that I do from, um, uh, Morris Maisel's, right? That was in right. practical neurology. And That's I right. hear that with patients all the time when I want them to be uh, trying home SPG blocks. Um, does anybody else have patients do home SPG blocks? I do, but infrequently. Uh, when it comes to doing it, you know, in, in the office, do you like to use a catheter? Do you like to do do them under ultrasound, fluoroscopy? And um, what are your thoughts about ultrasound versus fluoroscopy? So I, I would comment on that. So in, in the past, I always do percutaneous, uh, you know, uh, subsequomatic approach, uh, but that is expensive procedure to do. You have to do in the OR, under peril, or office space. 
Uh, and obviously, a lot of our neurology colleagues and you know and pain colleagues use an intranasal uh, spray with a sphenocast or TX360. But I found that to be uh, variable. Really depends on your experience uh, and then how you know how much do you do. Uh, and I recently confirmed with one of our ENT colleagues that that you know under the microscope uh, a blind uh, procedures uh, oftentimes you're not injecting uh, into the SPG4M intranasally because uh, it has to be behind the middle terminate. So, um, but I think you know intranasal is still is the most uh, economically and you know facility wise you know really easier to do. Um, but I, I am really advocating for a, a camera or endoscopic guided, very, very easy. Uh, and you can see the uh, sphenopalatine foramen behind the middle turbinate and then where you're gonna inject. So that's that's much easier than you know, in, in the operating room uh, setting or percutaneous procedure. The benefit seems to be really good. Uh, I would share some really early uh, Kind of experience. Obviously, we have not finished the studies yet. We're injecting Xperel, uh, which is off-label use of the uh, you know bupivacaine uh, uh, uh into the mucosas around sphenopalatine foramen intranasally, and we have seen big difference compared to uh, the group that injecting lidocaine only. But in a nutshell, I think it, it's, it could be done both ways, uh, intranasally or transcutaneously. Uh, and uh, it's definitely doable in office settings with better imaging guidance. Yeah, and I think the uh, the indication uh, for me often in the situation that you're going to use the block drives uh, what type of uh, injection you're going to be doing, and uh, kind of you know if it's a patient coming in with status migranosis uh, and they maybe have bilateral autonomic features, that's where I'd be more inclined to do something like the intranasal or Q-tip method of doing the uh, SPG block. If uh, in this patient's case, I think I would do the uh, the way they did, uh, did it, the uh, suprazygomatic. Uh, and, and, and I think they termed it right, a pterygopalatine fossa field block in that uh, I imagine what they did is they laid the patient down in a lateral decupitous position, uh, palpated above the zygomatic arch, and uh, usually it's, uh, uh, you know, with a 15 degree angle posteriorly towards the mandible. Uh, and they inject about five cc's uh, of uh, injectate with usually like a non-particulate steroid like dexamethasone and uh, bupivacaine. Uh, and then they have them on their lateral decupitous side for about 15 minutes and then kind of flip sides and do it the other way. So um, I, I think that I've had some good luck with that. And, um, you know, it's a little more cost effective than doing the fluoroscopically guided method. And, um, and, I, and it sounds like it's something that worked pretty well. Um, kind of uh, things we're exploring in, at our, in our practice is um, doing that method or with ultrasound for things where you don't have uh, access to fluoroscopy, where like we have some patients with pretty intractable uh, headaches with subarachnoid hemorrhage. And uh, we've been looking and evaluating it's, uh, this block's efficacy in those cases where you don't have the easy access to fluoroscopy and the the transnasal blocks are probably not going to be as effective. And, and there are some case reports and case series that show its benefit in opioid sparing in that very tough to treat patient population. But I think, um, you know, the fluoroscopy approach, I, I generally reserve for kind of that more classic kind of cluster headache presentation. Uh, and I find that pretty helpful. Are you treating those people with subarachnoid hemorrhage um, at the, in the acute stage, subacute or chronic stage? Uh, acutely, this is, uh, they're in the ICU mm -hmm. and, uh, we're, we're uh, we've got a study that we're prospectively looking and, uh, uh, and, uh, we do the bilateral blocks and, uh, and try to do it as a way to manage their pain when it's, uh, as you can, it's usually pretty intractable and the opioid options are pretty limited. Uh, and, um, and so far I've had some decent luck with it. 
And uh, I mean, loving loving this discussion about uh, SPG blocks. Uh, certainly, you know, uh, we could go go on uh, some of these questions with this group for quite a while. I I want to hear what people's thoughts are about uh, doing pulsed radio frequency treatment uh, versus um, doing a thermal ablation of the SPG blocks or of the SPG. What what do you um, what would you do in your practices? So I, I have we have pretty much stopped doing the post IF uh, approach. And one is mainly really because of insurance approval, a really hard time to get it. Uh, and second is that we uh, are not seeing very good, uh, you know, sustained benefits from using the post IF. So we have pretty much switched to all the IFA ablation approach. Um, but of course, you know, people are concerned about uh, long-term consequences, et cetera. So we don't offer about that rule. So most of the time we do just one side. But like, fortunately, most of the cluster headache, or et cetera, they're on one side. So we offer one side ablation. We also do sequential from 60 degrees to 70 degrees. Sometimes we have to do two times or three times. Uh, and in general, because it's, you know, it's much better tolerated. And if you're ablating transgeminal nerve, uh, we do warn them about kind of dry eye and then, you know, dry nose, et cetera. Uh, so far, patients have been tolerating well. The challenging actually is to locate the uh, this SPG ganglion itself because your IF needle is so tiny. Uh, if you're off a little bit, then there's no benefit. So you you really, it's different than, you know, a different game than just doing a field block. Uh, you have to be precisely uh, placing your needle. Sometimes you have to search for a long time to get the needle to the nerve ganglion. And you stimulate, you get an intranasal sensations like, hooray, you got it. And then you deliver your treatment. Uh, that's what we've been doing um, uh, for this, this ganglion. Um, in in regards, uh, I'd say that, uh, you know, in the literature uh, for cluster headache, the data would support using a, a traditional thermal coagulation RFA. Um, and uh, But uh, for sunk syndrome, there's a case series that looked at pulsed RFA. Um, uh, personally, I've, I've done pulsed RFA on a couple of patients, and I haven't had great dramatic responses to it. And so I'm kind of uh, like Dr. Chen, um, leaning away toward leaning away from that. Yeah, and I'm in I'm in the same boat. Um, when it comes to pulsed RF, uh, my, uh, my experience has not been uh, all that compelling. Um, but uh, then do you do diagnostic blocks beforehand or uh, do you just would you just go straight to doing a radio frequency ablation and if so what volumes would one use or what what are your thoughts if you do diagnostic blocks for the SPG we absolutely do diagnostic uh, and uh, uh, using very small volumes uh, typically we use about one and one and a half cc's and trying to get get it uh, we put a, a temperature probe on the cheek and see whether we can get it, uh, and, but it's it's really hard uh, to to get to that SPG. Uh, I would have to say so. A lot of times, I use electric stimulation to help me locate, then inject the uh, local anesthetics. Okay, fascinating. So, let's see. We have a question. Um, have you done any of those blocks on people a few months or years out from SAH who still have headaches? So that's a question for Narayan. Um. I can't uh, specifically remember offhand uh, somebody uh, with more of a chronic headache following subarachnoid hemorrhage, but uh, it would be definitely something that I would consider long term. Um, oftentimes, patients that have chronic headache after a subarachnoid hemorrhage, it's related to either one, they got put on something like tramadol or codeine while they're in the hospital and it just got never taken off and there's a little bit of medication overuse headache or two, uh, they are presenting with kind of new onset migraine kind of triggered or started after the subarachnoid hemorrhage. And so I, uh, I would first try kind of if, if the headache uh, sounds like a migraine or, or the, has that migraine phenotype. I would uh, try standard migraine uh, treatments, but uh, 
I think the Terrigo Palatine Fossa blocks would be something worth trying if uh, headaches were refractory to kind of standard management. Two, two comments. One, um, Narayan, we're embarking on a similar study as yours in our institution um, for acute, and I completely agree with you about uh, your comments about subacute and chronic presentations. More often than not, it's not um, rebound, you know, uh, opioid rebound related or opioid induced or medication overuse related, but more it's a new onset of uh, a headache uh, with migraine as features, in my experience. Okay, and another question. Would you consider peripheral nerve stimulation for trigeminal autonomic cephalalgias, perhaps occipital nerve stimulation? So great question. Um, of course, you know, we are talking now about after somebody has gone through the uh, pharmacologic therapies, you know, that um, Nicole had mentioned earlier, um, you would want to start with that, but then thinking about, oh, and then I guess one of the other things, talking about um, the non-invasive neuromodulation uh, options as well um, that can be used concomitantly with the oral medicines. Uh, what are your what are your thoughts about the use of neuromodulation and peripheral nerve stimulation uh, for trigeminal autonomic cephalalgias? Uh, if they have, uh, as you mentioned, intractable uh, uh, headaches where they've tried at least two oral preventive medications, I would, you know, if it's kind of the phenotype as the patient that presented, I'd hope that they tried. Uh, two or three probably being lamotrigine, topiramate, and probably carbamazepine. Um, and, and maybe I would say if they tried at least two or three of those, uh, I think it would be something reasonable to consider. I think um, I, I would use, before uh, doing something like an implantable device, um, there are some case series looking at uh, CGRP monoclonal antibodies in the treatment of sunk syndrome. And I would, if there were a migraine phenotype uh, kind of in that background, as we're talking about the overlap syndromes, I would definitely consider uh, trying that medication, uh, a, one of those medications. Uh, and then, yeah, I think uh, a occipital nerve stimulator uh, would be a reasonable consideration. And, and there is some decent evidence for uh, in prospective studies showing its benefit in sunk syndrome and cluster headache. Um, and there are some now uh, FDA cleared devices, or there's at least one company that's FDA cleared to use the 60 day occipital nerve stimulator for the treatment of headache. Uh, and so I think that'd be a reasonable thing to try. And I've had luck with uh, uh, at least one uh, patient with cluster headache and cro pretty intractable chronic cluster headache that responded to one of these 60 day sim systems where the got them out of the cycle, which was nice. Where, where was the stimulator placed for that person? Uh, did uh, this occipital, uh, bilateral occipital nerve stimulation uh, for, and he's not, this is actually, uh, we still have the leads in and it's getting pulled in, a, in about a week. Uh, and uh, after about four weeks, the he got out of the cycle, which is pretty, uh, uh, pretty incredible. So yeah. a couple of years There's ago, also the non-invasive neuromodulation. So uh, with the gamma core device is the one that has the FDA clearance for uh, some of the trigeminal autonomic cephalalgias. And so that's a transcutaneous vagal nerve stimulator. Um, what this um, patient received, uh, transcutaneous auricular vagal nerve stimulation also is you know, sounds like that's, you know, obviously for this patient, something that worked really well and a, a viable option. Um, and uh, for people who work at a VA, um, Gamma Core, I believe, is actually free for those patients, but outside the VA, it can be pretty pricey for patients. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Uh, I was just about to say that a couple of years ago, there was a, a new product developed uh, for sphenopalatin ganglion stimulations. Uh, autonomic technology, which is unfortunate. It, uh, for some reasons, I don't know that it's, uh, it did not continue, uh, but I was very hopeful that, you know, new technologies will come as a next step to target, uh, you know, sphenopalatine ganglion 
so that we don't need to ablate it, right? So that seems to be the consensus right now that, you know, if someone respond really well uh, to the block, uh, if the benefit lasts, don't, don't last very long, and the next step is to ablate it. Uh, but people don't really want to have lots of functions. Uh, and uh, neurostimulators uh, will, will, you know, will kind of fill in that role. Uh, and people are working on that. So I'm very excited for that. Dr. Ken, are you speaking of Pulsant? I think it's the autonomic technology from Redwood City. Oh, okay. Yeah, they actually did a clinical trial for a bunch of cluster headache patients. Uh, data was really good, but whatever reason, the company got bankrupted. <laughs> yeah, I, I, you're talking about the same product, just one of them's the company name, the other one's the product name. Yeah. And yeah, hopefully oh, yeah, 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 somebody right. will buy buy what's you know the remnants of the company and bring it back to market. Um, I don't know that ever had American clearance, but certainly in Europe uh, has clearance. And I have one patient uh, who had one implanted and uh, still still is able to use it. But if he ever needed it to to uh, be serviced, I don't think that there would be anybody to service it right now. So knock on wood there. Okay, so was that patient doing well, Doctor Schuster? Uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. The very interesting thing, though, is actually that his cluster headaches switch sides. Um, so he, you know, that's not something that you see very often at all. Um, interesting case for another day. Uh, but we have a second case that hopefully we can also uh, briefly discuss here. So right side lock facial pain over infraorbital, supraorbital areas, a 50-year-old male, BMI 25, uh, two years since headache onset, insidiate onset of headache over past two years, usually felt over periorbital area, pain is continuous, no specific aggravating factor or relieving factor, initially diagnosis Luter's neuralgia by ENT team, not relieved by gabapentinoids, amitriptyline, tramadol, NSAIDs, no past pertinent past medical history, and no headache associated symptoms. So for anybody who's listening to us talking about cases, it's so much more fun to treat patients who have associated symptoms, whether it's the migraineous features, the autonomic features. I asked the person who submitted it, this patient has none of those associated symptoms. Um, no family headache history, no allergies, was treated with a transnasal sphenopalatine ganglion block with local anesthetic, supraorbital, infraorbital nerve blocks with local anesthetic, ketamine burst, no significant response to any of them, not responsive to any of the medications or developed adverse effects from them. Uh, no pertinent exam labs, what other treatments should be tried. And so I think, do we have Scott here? Yeah, Scott, if you wanna jump on for a moment um, and uh, share a little bit about you know this possible diagnosis of Sluter's neuralgia, if you're available. Okay. Yes, uh, Scott is not available, but uh, we had uh, talked about this before uh, the case presentation. And when you look um, in the ICHD3, um, the only place where it's referenced is actually as being a synonym to of cluster headache. Uh, people in the literature have uh, questioned whether it's a diagnosis that should still be used. Essentially, what uh, some people use it as as um, being um, a synonym for sphenopalatine ganglion neuralgia, um, some people with cluster headache, some people just cause of whether it's nasal palate sort of area pain, uh, but not a, uh, once again, not something that's really a firm established diagnosis. Um, what are your thoughts about a patient um, like this? What diagnoses would you consider? What evaluations would you consider? Well, I mean, there's just so many different possibilities. I mean, the only thing is perioptal headache with no associated, you know, symptoms, no inciting events. It's just really difficult to kind of pin down a possible diagnosis, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, but the, the treatment the patient has gone through, uh, you know, have given us some clues. And I think if you believe, um, you know, what's if it's done properly, uh, it doesn't sound like it's SPG. Uh, you know, and there's no associated autonomic syndromes. Um, and, but I'm just not unclear is the pain is superficial versus deep uh, behind eyeball. 
Uh, but definitely that area raised kind of the concerns of, uh, you know, V1, trigeminal nerve, wh whether that is involved. I don't see any uh, phys physical exam results here, any sensory changes. Uh, and I assume that all the ophthalmology workup is negative. Um, and at this time, um, I, I think, you know, I, I, I'm not entirely sure whether this is a neuropathic versus maybe something else is going on. I just opened up with that. Uh, I'm sure panelists have a lot to say about this case. Well, well the first thing that's jumped to my mind is what's his intraocular pressure? Yeah, exactly. I mean, if it's not, resp <laughs> if it's not responsive and it doesn't tip fit into a typical syndrome that we'd be comfortable in assigning to it, what is, I, I, I wouldn't assume that his eye exam was normal. I want to know what the results were. Yeah, no, you're right. And I certainly would would have asked this patient a slew of questions. I, I'm not, you know, we don't we have limited information, but I certainly pry when the tax are possible still, you know, because patients don't often offer that they have, you know, maybe more tearing or they may not be observant enough to really realize it until it's mentioned to them. So it's something I probably would definitely go through each possible autonomic sim, uh, symptom with. And then you could consider neurologists. I was thinking, you know, why not throw an anti-epileptic at it? Because sometimes, you know, neurologists will respond to that versus, again, I was thinking possible in the medicine if we're sort of missing other features of attack. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, I don't know if this, you know, kind of going back to the original kind of talk about the ICHD, I don't know if this patient fits really nicely in, any ICHD criteria, I guess you'd uh, kind of put it in a chronic tension type headache, but the unilateral features of it is just re really atypical. And um, and it doesn't really have the autonomic features, which may or may not happen in uh, hemicrania continua. So it'd be, I guess that's something I'd be thinking about if it was a primary headache disorder. Um, but it's definitely a, a case where we need more information, and I would be uh, very, very uh, interested in getting, you know, either repeat imaging or tracking down the images that they've already had, um, and uh, making sure that we're not missing a secondary cause to this headache. Yeah, completely agree. You know, there's a lot of lot of questions I think we would all have when it comes to uh, if we had the opportunity to meet the patient, really evaluate them. I agree right now, ICHD3 wise, you know, you can't really put it into a firm diagnosis. Um, and sometimes we do have patients where you just, you know, have to write in your assessment that here are the things that argue for and against this, here are the ones that argue for and against this, and then thinking about what treatments you wanna try for the patient. Um, are there any particular treatments that you're thinking you might want to, um, that you might wanna to offer to this so patient? He has a novel crazy thought. And so I know we're like being recorded, so here I go, right? Um, but has anyone ever seen, I mean, um, assuming everything, assuming that I think the, the point was made about history is so important. Um, because we all know if we ask a person, how many headaches do you have in a month? They say eight. And then if we ask them, how many days have you been headache free in the last 30 days? They say one. Uh, so, so, so um, but assuming that everything was done in an appropriate way, could this somehow um, be a uh, asymmetry? Uh, what, what could this be related to a, a benign intracranial um, hypertensive kind of process, uh, not quite yet pseudotumor? And would there be a role in unless this person couldn't otherwise take it, a trial of uh, acetazolamide, Diamox, um, and seeing if the unilateral eye pain resolves. Um, I hate to jump into doing um, lumbar punctures to measure opening pressures, but I don't think that's beyond discussing uh, with the patient to be certain if, if repeat imaging and other more benign, uh, less invasive approaches did not yield um, 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 any results. But I think we have to try to pin down the diagnosis as much as possible. And, you know, unusual things happen all the time. And without looking, you wouldn't know. But, but I, I just think looking at this from a different mechanism point of view might be appropriate. I think that's an excellent point. And uh, looking at disorders of CSF dynamics is a, is a great thing to point out. And, uh, you know, 
specific questions I would ask this patient is, do they have a headache worsening with cough, bending over, tying their shoes? Because uh, one is the you know idiopathic intracranial hypertension, but I also would be thinking about spontaneous intracranial hypotension. Uh, and I've had patients present with unilateral hemicranial headaches, usually a cough headache, and we found uh, CSF venous fistulas in a MRI normal situation. And it was that cough headache that really clued us in. And, uh, you know, personally, I think all cough headaches are just CSF venous fistulas, but uh, that's a whole nother story. Uh, so I think the looking at the pressure, assuming that they don't, uh, you know, getting a sense of is it, it's hyper or hypotension, making sure they don't have glaucoma. So if we start a you know, acetazolamide or topiramate, we don't worsen problems, uh, it would be a very excellent thought. Excellent. Right. So a lot of places, I, I think it's really hard to suggest treatments at this point um, without doing further history taking and workup. So I agree with everybody about that. Um, we are very close to the hour and we're not gonna go over it. So if there's any other um, thoughts that people want to uh, bring up at this point, um, please don't hold back. Okay, wonderful. Well, this was so much fun. Thank you so much to our panelists. I really enjoyed the conversation and thank you to everybody who joined. I hope that this was educational for you. And um, we'll have to uh, maybe get together again and do this again another time. So thank you so much, everybody, and have a good evening. Thank you, thank you for organizing so much. Bye. Great to see you one. Bye-bye.